From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in A Doll's House. Lux presents Hollywood. It's your purchases of our products, Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Flakes, ladies and gentlemen, that make this program possible. For the splendid loyalty you show us, our sincere gratitude. Last week, we announced an offer of a beautiful compact. So many of the ladies in our audience have taken advantage of this offer. We are making it again tonight at the end of our program. So please listen carefully and have your pencils ready. Starred tonight are Joan Crawford, Basil Rathbone, Sam Jaffe, Netta Harrigan, and Vernon Steele in A Doll's House. As special guest, Miss Frances Manson, head of the story department of Samuel Golden Productions. Our orchestra is conducted by Louis Silvers. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play is the work of one of the loneliest figures in literature, Henrik Ibsen. Poverty-stricken as a boy, Ibsen exiled himself for many years from his native Norway because of the lukewarm reception that country gave his plays. First produced many years ago, A Doll's House provoked a storm of angry criticism because the playwright dared express the belief that a happy marriage must have a foundation of truth, freedom, and intellectual companionship. Like all masterpieces, A Doll's House has a deathless quality and has brought fame to a score of world-renowned actresses, to which list we add tonight the name of Joan Crawford. And no one is less conscious of her success than Joan herself. She tackles each new job with the same I've-got-to-make-good attitude that she had when she first arrived here, fresh from a Schubert chorus. A Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer star, Joan is seen next in The Shining Hour and is heard tonight as Nora Helmer. Co-starred as Torvald Helmer, a part more sympathetic than his usual roles, is that master of glistening villainy, Basil Rathbun. One of Hollywood's more gentle and considerate citizens, off the screen. This splendid actor is currently flaunting his darksome deviltry in the adventures of Robin Hood. And is with us this week, straight from the set of Paramount's If I Were King. Sam Jaffe, who gave such a remarkable performance of the ancient llama in Lost Horizon, plays Krogstadt. The same role which brought him unstinted praise when a doll's house played on Broadway this season. Netta Harrigan plays Mrs. Linden. And Vernon Steele is Dr. Ronk. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in A Doll's House. The year is 1890. We're in a little town in Norway on a gray September afternoon. Along the windy street in a quiet section of the city, a young woman walks hurriedly, her long dress whipping out behind her, her face half buried in an old-fashioned muff. She glances frequently over her shoulder, as if to assure herself that, that she's not been noticed. Then she stops, and after a final nervous glance, darts quickly into a doorway. Well? It's I, Mrs. Helmer. Oh. Come in, please. Sit down, Mrs. Helmer. Thank you. Uh, wasn't it a little indiscreet of you to come here, I mean? Oh, I was very careful, Mr. Krogstad. I'm quite sure no one saw me. I hope not. Did uh, you think it over, Mr. Krogstad? The matter we spoke of yesterday? Yes. The lending of money, Mrs. Helmer, is a serious business. Oh, I know it is. It's even more serious when the loan is to be made to a wife without the consent or even knowledge of her husband. Oh, but he mustn't know. He mustn't even dream that I've borrowed the money. That's why I came to you. You've known him at the bank. Yes, at the bank and at school. But we were never very friendly. Well, you worked with him. You must know how he feels about being in debt. He has a dread of it, Mr. Krogstad. He, he thinks debts are immoral, almost criminal. 
He'd never allow me to owe the butcher or the baker a single krona. And now you wish to borrow a great many kronas. Because he needs it. Oh, you know how ill he's been. And now the doctors say that he must go away to rest. A long rest in Italy. And if he doesn't go, he'll never be well again. I want to save my husband's life, Mr. Krogstad. Mrs. Helmer, I wish I could help you. Does that mean you won't? Oh, but I'll pay it back. I promise I will. I'll, I'll save him. And I could make money other ways. I'm very clever at copying. Mrs. Helmer, and... is there anyone you could get to sponsor the loan? Sponsor it? To sign the note with you and act as surety. I mean a man, of course. Well, I don't know. There's no one I'd like to ask for fear Torvald would find out. And... Well, you have a father living. My father? What would he do? If he'd sign the note with you, yes. Oh, then he will. I, I'm sure he will. Very well. Oh, thank you. Now, here is the note. Yes, when you come back to me with the note signed by you here and your father's signature down here, I'll let you have the money. Oh, how wonderful. It really isn't difficult at all, is it? Oh, I almost wish Torval could know. Then perhaps he'd see how clever I really am. Oh, but he mustn't. All he must know is that we have money from somewhere and that we're going away to Italy. Tie yourself out dancing like that. Oh. Watch out, Jasper. Oh. <laughs> now sit down, Nora, please. Oh, Torvald, isn't it wonderful? I feel as if I belonged here, as if I'd lived in Italy all my life. Oh, and now I've learned to dance the tarantella. Yes, and you dance it beautifully, Nora. Oh, it's so easy to dance here, where your heart is light. Aren't you glad I teased you until you brought me? <laughs> Very glad. Oh, and the rest has been good for you, Torval. So good. Oh, nonsense. I never needed a rest. Oh, no, of course you didn't. It was just for me. And I love you for it. Oh, you can hardly thank me. I could never afford a trip like this. It was strange, your father leaving you that money. Strange, Torval? I always thought he was rather improvident. I, uh, I was sure that he'd die quite penniless. <laughs> well, he, he must have had some put away. Yes, yeah, nevertheless, it's almost gone, my dear. We'll have to be leaving for home soon. Oh, I know. But I'm so anxious to see the children again. Ellen, you can put these flowers in water. Oh, flowers too, ma'am. Oh, yes, Ellen, and so awfully expensive. Mm. Oh, uh, did the Christmas tree come yet? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I put it in the kitchen so the children wouldn't see it. <laughs> Is that you, Nora? Oh, Torvald, I'm so glad you're home. Come and see all the presents I have. Look, Torvald. You mean to say you've bought all these? <laughs> oh, just a few little things for the children and Ellen and Anna and, and Dr. Ronk. And... Mm -hmm. I suppose you spent every penny I gave you. Oh, no, I, I did have some left, and then I I saw those heavenly roses. Oh, but that's so extravagant. Oh, I know, Torvald, I know, but I, I just couldn't resist. And what did you buy for yourself? Oh, I don't need anything. Nonsense. Tell me, what'd you like? Something useful, something sensible. Well... Hmm? If you really do want to give me something, you could give me money. Now, Nora. Uh, and then I could buy myself something just what I needed. But there's no Christmas spirit about cold, hard money. Oh, yes, there is. But you're so extravagant, Nora. On that trip to Italy last winter, we simply can't afford to go on throwing money about you now. Oh, but you'll be making lots of money now, and we could always get a little credit. Credit? Nora, have you ever known me to borrow money? No, but it ought to be easy enough now. I want no creditors in my life, thank you. We've held out all these years without ever owing anyone a penny, and we're certainly not going to begin now at the last minute. Yes, darling. Of course, you know best. At the same time, we're, uh, we're not exactly paupers. Look, what do you think I've got here? Oh, Torvald, money? Oh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Yeah, yeah, give that oh, back. Oh, Torvald, darling, thank you. This will go a long way. I should hope so. <laughs> No one would believe how much it costs a man to keep a little thing like you. A lady to see you, Mrs. Helmer. A lady? Well, ask her to come in, Ellen. Yes, ma'am. Well, I must get back to the bank for a while. Goodbye, darling. Come home early tonight. I'll try. This way, please. Who is it, Ellen? Oh. Nora. How are you? You... You don't remember me, do you? No, I... I don't think I... Why, yes, Christine. Is it really you? 
It really is. Christina. And to think I didn't even know you, but you're so changed. Yes, I... I guess I am in... in nine or ten years. Oh, good heavens, has it been as long as that? But what are you doing in town? I arrived on the morning boat. Oh, yes, to spend Christmas. How wonderful. Oh. Oh, what a thoughtless wretch I am. Oh, darling, how can you forgive me? Forgive you? Oh, Christina, I forgot that you... That your husband... Yes, my... My husband died three years ago. Yes, I saw it in the papers, but... Well, you know how it is. Did he, uh, leave you anything? Nothing. Not even any children? No. Nothing? Not anything? Not even a regret. Oh, darling, you must tell me the whole story. I never would have dreamed it. It must have been awful. And to be absolutely alone afterwards. Oh, you know, I have two of the sweetest children. Just wait till you see them. They're out with their nurse now. So there's nothing to disturb us, and you can tell me all about it. No, dear. You tell me. No, really, darling, I won't be selfish today. Oh, uh, but uh, I must tell you one thing. Have you heard of our wonderful luck? No, what is it? My husband has been appointed manager of the savings bank. He has? Oh, how pity it is. Oh, Christina, can you imagine how it makes you feel to have lots of money? Not only what you need, but just heaps of oh. money. <laughs> oh, Nora. <laughs> Nora, you haven't changed a bit. You're... You're still the same old Spencer. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I've had to work. You work? Oh, but why? Well, Torvald was ill, you know, and of course you mustn't tell Christina. Tell what? Well, we needed money, and of course we didn't have any. So I went. So Torvald thinks we inherited the money from my father. Nora, wasn't it a, a little rash of you? But it saved his life. But won't you tell him? Oh, after a great many years, perhaps, when I'm not so young. Oh. <laughs> well, don't laugh, Christina. I mean, when Torvald isn't so much in love with me. When it isn't fun for him any longer to see me skipping about and dressing up and acting. Well, then it might be good to have something in reserve. <laughs> oh. Now, now, what about you? What are you going to do, Christina? Oh, I wish I knew, my dear. I'll have to find work, I suppose. I, um... I was wondering a while ago, Nora, if... What, Christina? Well, with... With your husband a bank official? You mean he might be able to do something for you? Well, I was oh, hoping... Oh, darling, that's a wonderful idea. Nora, do you really suppose... Oh, just you leave it all to me. I'll give you a note to, to him, and you, you go to the bank and see him. Oh, I know he'll give you the position if I ask. Oh, Nora, you, you don't know how much this means to me. Poor Christina. I'll, I'll write the note at once. Children, come in, darlings. Mama's here. Mama, he threw a snowball and hit me. I did not. I hit him back. Oh, my baby. Mmm, such cheeks. Darling, you've been out for hours. Aren't you frozen? I'm warm. I saw a dog, Mama. He ran after a man and he growled. I saw the dog, too. Oh, did you, my sweet? And the man picked up a stick and the dog ran around biting people. Really? Oh, I know he didn't bite you, though, did he, darling? I'd like a dog. I'll just take their coats, ma'am. Oh, yes, Ellen. Can we play now, Mama? Of course, darling. Any single thing you want is Christmas Eve. Isn't it? I want to play Blind Man's Buff. Blind Man's Buff? All right, now you know what you do first. I know, oh, I know, oh, Mama. Me. Oh. It's a man, Mama. What do you want, Mr. Crookset? You see, the door was open, and I thought. My husband's not at home, Mr. Crookset. Yes, I, I know. Children, go to Ellen. Come on, Emmy. Wait. What did you come here for? It isn't the first of the month, Mr. Crook, said. It isn't that. I wanted to ask you something. An hour ago at the bank, a lady asked to see Mr. Helmer. She said she had a note from you. Well? Would you mind telling me if that lady was a... a Mrs. Linden? Yes. Do you know her? I... I haven't seen her for a great many years. Naturally, I was surprised when I heard her inquire for your husband. It isn't surprising. She's going to be given a position at the bank. She is? Why, yes. But... But how? Well, you see, sometimes a little influence with the right people, Mr. Cook. You mean you had something to do with it? Well, naturally, I did what I could for my friend. Why? Come now, Mrs. Helmer. You know very well whose job it is your friend is getting. What are you talking about? So I'm just to be thrown out, am I? What? Oh, you needn't pretend you didn't know. How dare you talk like that to me? I didn't know. My husband doesn't tell me his business. Mrs. Helmer, I must ask you to use your influence for me. But I have no influence, whatever. But you just said you had, That's Mrs. Helmer. That's quite different. If someone is to be hired and if Mrs. Linden is capable, 
Being an old friend of mine might help with my husband. But this, well, this is different. Do you expect me to be able to tell my husband what to do? I'm truly sorry for you. Miss Alma, I don't want your pity. I want your help. You're trying you really to can't me. refuse me. You're trying to frighten me, but I'm not afraid of you anymore. In a little while, I'll have paid off the note, and I'll be through with the whole business. Please, listen to me, Mrs. Helma. Try to understand that it's vital for me to keep my job at the bank. I'm sorry, but really, I'm quite helpless. I tell you, I've got to keep it, that's all. I've got children, and they're growing up. They need to have a father who's able to hold up his head in a respectable position. I tell you, my job at the bank is the only chance I've got to get anywhere. I'm sorry, but I just can't listen. You've got to listen. Mr. Coke said you're threatening me. I don't care what you call it. Would you tell my husband I owe you money? I don't know. Why, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. When it's all my own secret and I'm so proud of it. Why, if he heard about it that way, there's no telling how unpleasant it would be. Unpleasant? Mrs. Helmer, I'm afraid there are some things you don't understand very well. Let me make them clear up for you. You needn't bother. When your husband was ill, you came to me to borrow a sum of money. I promised to find you the money in exchange for a written agreement which I drew up. Your father was to sign this agreement. Was to? He did sign it. Did he, Mrs. Helmer? Well, you know he did it. Anyway, haven't I made my payments on time? Mrs. Helmer, your father was very ill, wasn't he? Yes, he was on his deathbed. Tell me, Mrs. Helmer, do you happen to remember the day he died? The day of the month, I mean. It was the 29th of September. Ah, that's correct. But you see, I made a little investigation for myself, and I discovered a rather remarkable fact, which I can't quite explain. What remarkable fact? The remarkable fact is, or seems to be, that... Your father signed this paper three days after his death. I don't understand. I... Well, uh... neither do I, Mrs. Helmer. Here your father dies on the 29th of September, and here he signs his name on October the 2nd. There's the date, don't you see? Now, isn't that remarkable? Perhaps you can explain it. Your father really did write his name here himself, didn't he? No. No, I wrote it. Do you realize what you're admitting? That was a very dangerous thing to do, Mrs. Helmer. But why? You'll have your last payment in a few days. Mrs. Helmer, you really don't seem to understand what you've done. Do you know, Mrs. Helmer, that I did something just about like that once, and it ruined me? You mean you took a risk to save someone's life? The law, Mrs. Helmer, takes no account of motives. Then the law must be very bad. Bad or not. If I take this paper to court, the law will condemn you exactly as it did me. I don't believe it. As if I didn't have the right to save my father from worry when he was dying. As if anyone should tell me that I hadn't the right to save my husband's life. I don't know very much about law, and I don't want to if that's the way it is. But I'm certain they'd let you do that. Why, the idea of not knowing they would. When you're a lawyer, you must be a very poor one. Maybe I am. But I do understand something about this business you and I are in together. And now, Mrs. Helmer... You can do exactly as you please. But let me tell you this one thing. If I'm thrown off into the mud again, there'll be others to keep me company. <laughs> well, I must go, Paul. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. It's Christmas Eve. Well, I, uh, I don't hear Nora persuading me. Well, what? Oh... Oh, yes, please stay, Dr. Ron. No, oh, no. I have patients waiting for me in the morning. People are as sick on Christmas Day as any other day. Then, then you must come again tomorrow. I will, if I'm still alive. Oh, what a way for a doctor to talk. Good night. Good night. Good night, Doctor. <sighs> well, I still have a little work to do before bed. Oh, no, Torvald. I, I want you to talk with me. Now, what would that be about? By the way... Was anyone here this afternoon? No, just Christina. You gave her the position, Torvald. Oh, yes. Yes, but uh, when I came home, I thought I saw Krogstad leaving the house. Krogstad? Well, he really was here, but just for a minute. Nora. Well, it was just for a minute. Nora, look at me. I'm very, very much surprised. Krogstad has been asking you to put in a good word for him, hasn't he? Hmm? Are you going to be angry with me? And you were supposed to do it just as if you'd thought of it yourself. Well, yes, but I... No, Nora. And you could stoop to that, to speak to such a man, to, to make a promise, and then to, to lie about it, to me. Now, you... You won't do that again, will you, dear? Will you? Well, 
Well, we won't say any more about it. Torvald, tell me. Was it really something awful this Krogst had gotten into trouble over? Oh, forgery, that's all. You know what that means. But don't, don't you think he might have been forced to do it? Hmm? Perhaps. And I'm not so hard-hearted as to condemn a man for a single slip. Oh, no, of course not. And a man can redeem his character if he admits his crime and takes his punishment. Crime? But Krogstad didn't. He dodged and used all kinds of tricks. He was disbarred, of course, but he, uh... Well, he should have been sent to jail. But don't you think he had responsibilities? Children? After all, he might have done it for their sake. Yeah, that's the worst of it. It's like a poison, especially for the children. How do you mean? Oh, I've seen it time and time again. It's really amazing to see how criminal tendencies in children can be traced to lying parents. This Krogstad has been contaminating his children for years. But how? Oh, by his life of lies and deceit, of course. They're all drawn into it with him. Sad, isn't it? I can sympathize with you when you feel sorry for him. But you'll promise not to say any more about it. Hmm? Well, I'm going to my study. I won't be long. Oh, dear God. Mrs. Helmer. Uh, Mrs. Helmer, the children want to come and say goodnight. What? The children. Shall I bring them in to you? No. No, not now, Ellen. So ends the first act of A Doll's House, starring Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun. Before they return in the second act, we want to present to you in verse our own version of a few historical love affairs. We must admit we've improved on history a little, which is just another way of saying that you'll find our verse historically inaccurate. Anyway, we think you'll find it amusing. Our first subject is the devastating Helen of Troy. Greek Helen of Troy had a way with a boy that caused the upheaval of nations. To buy her a cloak, Menelaus went broke, and an army went short on its rations. But her jewels counted not, her robes were but aught, we've learned from historical data. We'll give you the dope. She used Lux toilet soap, and her face was what launched the regatta. We jump now to colonial times and to the comely maiden, Priscilla. Priscilla was fair and had smoothly brushed hair when John came to woo her for Standish. But she wanted John with no pro or con, why the idea of Miles was outlandish. She got her own way and her confidence lay, not in clothes so demure and colonial. It's easy, why shucks? It's because she used Lux. It's a passport to things matrimonial. And now we come to Miss 1938, in whom we're all most interested. The girl of today wears a suit and beret. She ponders on color selection. But though fashions vary, they are still secondary compared with a lovely complexion. And she knows it still pays, as it did in past days, to keep her skin clear and attractive. And of course, if she's clever, she'll do it forever with Lux, for its lather is active. The famous beauties of history understood the relation between lovely skin and romance. The famous beauties of our own day, the lovely stars of Hollywood, understand it too. Nine out of ten of them use Lux toilet soap to protect their beauty. Its active lather removes dust, dirt, and stale cosmetics thoroughly. Guards against choked pores that cause cosmetic skin, dullness, tiny blemishes, enlarged pores. Protect the loveliness of your skin the easy Hollywood way. Use Lux toilet soap before you renew makeup, always before you go to bed. May I remind you that an important announcement comes at the end of our performance tonight. I suggest that the ladies have pencil and paper ready. Now, our producer. Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun continue in a doll's house with Sam Jaffe and Nedda Harrigan. Christmas Day finds Nora in a state close to hysteria. Under the influence of her husband's stern philosophy, she's fearful of contaminating her children with her presence. And so she's not seen them for almost 24 hours. Now, late in the afternoon, she knocks timidly at the door of her husband's study. Come in. Well, Nora? Am I disturbing you, Torval? Oh, uh... Well, just a little, but um, uh, what do you want, dear? Torvald, if I were to ask you for something, to beg you for something very prettily, would you do it? Nora, 
You can't mean what you were hinting at yesterday. Oh, yes, for my sake, Torvald. You must let Crogster keep his place in the bank. My dear Nora, it's his place that I'm giving to your friend, Mrs. Oh, Linda. Oh, yes, darling, and that's so good of you. But instead of Crogster, couldn't you just dismiss some other clerk? Dismiss some other clerk? What's the matter with you, Nora? Just because you were impulsive enough to promise to put in a good word for him, I'm to... No, it's not that. It's, it's not that I said anything to him. But it, it's for your own sake, Torvald. I'm so terribly afraid of him. Why? Well, I... I hear he's rather malicious, and there's no telling what he might say. That's why I beg yes, you... Yes, and the more you plead for him, the more you make it impossible for me to keep him on. Oh, darling, please. Now, there's no use going any further with this. The matter's closed. I've just sent a messenger out with a letter. What letter? A Krogstad's dismissal. Oh, call it back again, Torval. There's still time for my sake, for your own. Oh, listen, please, Torval. You don't know what might happen because of it. Now, come, Nora. What do you expect me to do? What are you about being slandered or blackmailed by a wretched fellow like Krogstad? Really? I can forgive you only because I know it's proof of your love for me. And that's as it should be. Let what will happen when it comes to the pinch. I think you'll find my shoulders are broad enough to bear the burden. No, no, you'll never do that. I won't let you. Well, well, we'll do it together then. We'll share it. Man and wife. How would you like that? Now, 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 now. Stop worrying. It's just your imagination. I'll tell you what. Take your tambourine and practice your tarantella. Tarantella? Yes. You're going to dance it at the Stenbogs' party tonight. You haven't forgotten, have you? Um, no, no, I, I remember. <laughs> Mrs. Helmer. Is Dr. Ronkin? Why, yes, come in. Come in, Nora. Thank you. Well, sit down, Nora. I was just about to leave for your house. Dr. Ronk, there's something I want to ask you. I'm, I'm not disturbing you, am I? I always have time for you, Nora. I always will have. Just as long as I'm able. As long as... What does that mean? Does that frighten you? Well, I think it's an odd expression, isn't it? Do you expect anything to happen? Oh, something that's no surprise. Is there something you've really discovered? I've been auditing my life account, Nora. Oh, you've discovered something about yourself. Yes, and it looks as if I'm bankrupt. Before very long, my poor carcass will be rotting in the churchyard. Oh, what a dreadful way to talk. Dreadful? Well, it's a dreadful business. There's one final test to be made, and then we'll know exactly when disintegrations have taken. Oh, Dr. Rank. As soon as I'm certain of the worst. I'll send you my visiting card, and then you'll know that really serious things have begun. I won't listen. You know you're exaggerating. You just like to talk this way. You mustn't think of dying and leaving Torvald and me. You're our oldest friend. Oh, you will get over it. The absent are soon forgotten. Do you think so? People make fresh ties. Although I... I do hate to leave it all. Oh, nonsense. You shan't leave us. And without leaving behind as much as a little token of gratitude. Nothing but some space... The first person that comes along can fill that. And just suppose if if I were to ask you for... For what? For a great proof of your friendship. For a very, very great service. Would you, for once, make me so happy? Oh, but you don't know what it is. Then tell me. Don't you trust me? Oh, oh I do, Dr. Rank. It's, it's something you must help me prevent. You know how deeply, how really deeply Torval loves me. He wouldn't hesitate a moment to give his very life for me. Nora, do you think he's the only one? What, what do you mean? Who'd gladly give his life for you. Oh. I wanted to say it to you once, before I... before I go away. I'll never find a better moment. Well, I've told you. Now you know you can trust me as you can trust no one else. Well, Dr. Rand, well? how could you be so... Why did you say that? It was all so nice before. Nora, oh, I can't tell you anything oh, now. You mustn't punish me, not that way. Let me help no, you, No, you can't do anything for me now. Besides, it's not... Oh, I, I really don't want any help. I, I have to leave now. Goodbye, Dr. Ron. Oh, I'm glad you've come home, ma'am. There's a man here to see you. Mr. Krogstad. Here? Ellen, where's Mr. Helmer? He's out, ma'am. Gone over to fetch Dr. Ronk. Oh. Mr. Krogstad's in the library, ma'am. Thank you, Ellen. What do you want here? I want some information, Mrs. Helmer. Be quick, then. What is it? You know, I've been dismissed. I couldn't prevent it, Mr. Krogstad. I fought and I stood up for you, but it wasn't any use. 
Oh. Is that all he cares for? Oh, please, for you? you won't tell. Think of my children. Why should I? Did you and your husband think of mine? However, I've come to tell you that you needn't take this matter too seriously. I'm not going to use this information I've got. Not for the present, anyway. Oh, Mr. Cook, said I knew you wouldn't. In fact, no one need know. It can remain just between us three. Oh, no. My husband must never know. Why? Are you ready to pay off the balance? Well, no, not, not at the moment, but it won't be long before it's no. all paid in the... I'm going to hold on to that note. Why? What would you do with it? Just keep it, Mrs. Helmer. Don't worry. No one else will ever know anything about it. So that if you had any desperate scheme in mind, put it right out of your head. We all think such things at first. I did too, Mrs. Helmer. But I didn't have the courage. No, nor I. No. You wouldn't have the courage either. Would you, Mrs. Helmer? It would be very foolish. Very, very foolish. Now... I've written a letter to your husband. To my husband? Sparing you as much as possible. But he must never see it. Tear the letter up. I'll get the money somehow. I'm sorry, Mrs. Helmer, but I think I've told you I don't want it. Well, then what do you I'll want? I'll tell you what I want. I want her to gain my foothold in the world. I want to get back to where I belong. I want to rise. And your husband shall help me. Oh, he won't. He will. I know him, Mrs. Helmer. He won't dare put up a fight. And when he and I are together there, you'll see. Yes, within a year, I shall be his right-hand man. It won't be Torvald, Helmer. It'll be Niels Cox that runs the bank. No. No? Who will stop me? Somebody who has the courage. Oh, you can't frighten me. A petted, pampered creature like you. Oh, you'll see. You'll see. Under the ice, perhaps? Down in the cold, black water? The next spring to come up again, ugly? Unrecognizable? <laughs> no, no. People don't do that sort of thing, Mrs. Helmer. And anyway, what will be the use of it? I've got your husband in my pocket, no matter what you do. Not after I'm gone. Not after You forget. I... Your reputation is in my hands. You can think of that when you're planning to do something foolish. I'll drop this letter in the mailbox on my way out. No, please. I expect to hear from your husband very soon. I'm trying to get the mailbox open. But where's the key? I haven't one. Christina, look. There's a letter in there, and it's from Krogstad. Krogstad? Yes, and now Torvald will know everything. Oh, believe me, dear. It will really be best for both oh, of you. Oh, but you don't understand. I forged a name. I forged Papa's name. No. Listen, Christina. You must witness this. What is there to witness? If anything should happen, if I should go out of my mind, if, if anything should happen so that I wouldn't be here. Nora, you, you've lost control of your If yourself. anyone else should try to take the whole blame on himself, you are my witness that it was all my doing. No one else knew anything Nora. about it. Nora. Oh, I'm not out of my mind, Christina. I know what I'm saying. I did the whole thing. You will remember, won't you? Of course I'll remember, but I don't know what you mean. Oh, no. No, how could you? Because a very wonderful thing is going to happen. A miracle is going to come. A miracle? Yes, a very wonderful thing. But it's so terrible too, Christina. Oh, it mustn't happen. Don't. Don't, dear. I, I shall go to Krogstad right now and talk to him. You? What can you do? In the old days, he, he would have done anything for me. Krogstad? I knew him very well. Nonsense. You must come tonight. No, I'd better not. Oh, listen. But everyone will it's Torvald, Dr. Rand. They're coming up the stairs. Torvald mustn't see Go me. inside. I'll try to find Why Krogstad. In heaven's name Don't you give up hope, Nora. A miracle. It must happen. Oh, it must. Come in, Runk. And I still say you're quite mad. <laughs> Perhaps. Well, Nora. Home again? Yes. How do you do, Dr. Runk? Good evening, Nora. Oh, what's the matter with you, Nora? You're quite upset. Have you been practicing too hard? No, I haven't practiced at all yet. But you'll have to. Oh, yes, I must. I, I must practice a great deal. But, Torvald, I can't without you. I know I've forgotten everything. Oh, well, when you've worked on it, it'll come back to you. Sit down, Runk. Where are you going, Torvald? Uh, just have a look at the mailbox. Oh, no, no, don't, don't do that. Oh, why not? Torvald, I'm sure there are no letters there. Well, just let me look Oh, at no, it. if you don't rehearse with me, I won't be able to dance tonight. What? 
You're really as nervous as all that oh, about it? terribly terrible. Let's rehearse now. There's time before dinner. Sit down and play for me, and you can direct me. You know the way you used to do. All right, all right. What a creature. Play, Torvald, play. Slower, slower. I can't do it any slower. Not so violent, Nora. But I must. Oh, Nora, that will never do. Oh, Torvald, please. I, I told you I needed to practice. Let me play for her. Perhaps we can do it slower. Oh, yes, please. Now, now look, Torvald, sit here, and then you can watch me. All right. Now try to calm yourself. Yes, darling, I will. How's this, Torvald? Is it better? Nora, Nora, there's no need to dance as though it were a matter of life and death. Right, stop. This is all out of control. Stop, I say. Nora, I don't see how you could have forgotten everything that way. But I told you I had. Oh, Torvald, you must practice with me right up to the last minute. Promise, Torvald. Well, certainly, if you wish. Well, you're to think of nothing but me. Not a letter, not a paper. You mustn't even look at the mailbox until after the party. Very well, my dear. But you seem so... so overwrought. Now, um, let's all go in and we'll have dinner and... Uh, then we can practice again later. Thank you, Torvald. Come along, Rock. Thanks. Seven o'clock. Five hours until midnight. And the Tarantella will be over. Five hours to live. Nora! Nora, are you coming? Coming, Torvald! <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain falls on Act Two of A Doll's House. Before we hear Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun in Act Three, we spend this brief intermission with another personality from backstage Hollywood, Francis Manson, chief story editor of Samuel Goldwyn Productions. Miss Manson came here from Columbia University, where she taught short story writing and advertising. Today, she's one of that highly important group who, seeking for good motion picture stories, wade through the vast mass of material turned out by the world's authors. And now, Miss Manson, what's your story? A complaint, Mr. DeMille. We've had a very definite lack of story material. If good stories were only half as plentiful around Hollywood as Lux soap, I'd be a lot happier. There's a cake of Lux in practically every dressing room in Hollywood, but there are only about ten good motion picture ideas in every 1,100 stories in spite of the fact that about half the letters that come to producers are from people claiming they have great ideas for film stories, we're still screaming for new material. Many of these unsolicited stories may be great, but every unknown writer who sends us one is certain of receiving it back promptly and unopened. Mm, we can't give them a chance because we can't take a chance. That's it. A lot of people think we're just waiting for the opportunity to steal their ideas. Obviously, that isn't true, and here's a typical example. We received a letter from a man who said, I have a great idea for Gary Cooper. Make him a cowboy in his next picture and let him fall in love with a society girl. Please send me a check for $1,000 immediately as I am going on my vacation next Tuesday. <laughs> I assume he went on his vacation without your assistance. Right. You, may, you know as well as I do, Mr. DeMille, that such a vague suggestion doesn't mean very much. An idea like that is so obvious that it had already occurred dozens of times to writers at the studio and hundreds of times to people outside the studio. As a matter of fact, in reference to this particular case, Mr. Goldwyn had already started work on a picture called The Lady and the Cowboy with Gary Cooper and Merrill Oberon. Imagine how embarrassing it would be if we read every manuscript we received. Without a doubt, a manuscript would be bound to contain an episode somewhere in it that might slightly resemble part of our movie script. And human nature being what it is, we would never convince the would-be author that we had not stolen his play and changed it around to suit ourselves. The safest plan for all concerned is the one we follow, namely not to open any manuscript which comes in unsolicited. This is the firmest rule in Hollywood. Then what outlets are open to the would-be screenwriter, Miss Manson? My advice is this. Prove your ability first, write for the magazines, for the book publishers, or the play producers. 
and we'll grab you without further delay. In other words, if you want to write for Hollywood, don't write for Hollywood until we ask you. Well, what do you think of the ones we've already asked? As a rule, the important screenwriters are quite as temperamental as actors. But at times you can't blame them because the producers they work for are temperamental too. Heresy, Miss Manson. That requires explanation. I can recall one producer who summoned in his writers and said he wanted the scope of the story to be much bigger. This isn't big enough, he said. I want it to be great. I want it to be infinitesimal. And the producer was not Mr. Goldwyn. <laughs> then there's the producer who reluctantly agreed to read a certain writer's story. All right, he said, I'll read it with an open mind, but I may as well warn you, I think it's terrible. <laughs> but writers, in turn, are often something of a problem to producers. For instance, Robert Riskin has to write every line of a screenplay in longhand. S.K. Lauren has to go away and do his creating in a shack. Joe Swirling will spend weeks at wood carving and not write a single line. Then suddenly appear, call for a dictaphone, and give forth a complete shooting script without having put a word down on paper. Still, in my opinion, the screenwriter is entitled to every bit of individuality he cares to assert. The fact remains that he delivers the goods and contributes what, to me, is the most important phase of pictures, the story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Manson. Act Three of A Doll's House, starring Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun with Sam Jaffe and Netta Harrigan. Later the same night, with Christina gone to use her influence with Krogstadt, Nora dances at the party. <laughs> faster and faster she whirls about the room, her cheeks two spots of crimson, her eyes burning, and then the tarantella ends. <laughs> Nora! Nora, come here. Oh, Torvald, did I dance well? You were magnificent, my dear. You remembered everything I told you. Come now. We must go home. Oh, no. Not yet, darling. Just a little longer. But it's late, Nora. And you're tired. Yes. Yes, I am tired. Come along, dear. We'll say good night. So slowly, Nora. Let me help you. I'm even more tired than I thought. There we are. You see, I was perfectly right not to let you stay any longer. Yes, darling. Everything you do is right. Torval, what are you doing? I want to clear out the mailbox. It's so late, Torval. Won't tomorrow do? Look at all the letters that have collected. Why? What's this? What? Dr. Rank's visiting card. It was right on top. He must have just put it in tonight. I wonder what this means. What is it? This black cross over his name. What a ghastly idea. You'd think he was announcing his own death. He is. What? How do you know? Has he told you something? That card is his farewell. He's going to shut himself up alone and die. Oh, poor old Runk. Of course, I knew we couldn't hope to keep him long, but so soon. And to go off alone, like a wounded animal. When one goes, it's best to go silently, don't you think? I just can't realize that he's gone. He'd grown into our lives so. Oh, well, perhaps it's for the best, at least for him. And for us, too, because now we have to depend entirely on each other. Go in, dear. Oh, it's a relief to be home again. Come here, Nora, you enchanting creature. Torval, don't, please. Why not? Oh, I know what it is. You have the tarantella still in your blood. And it makes you all the more tempting. Read your letters, Torva. Oh, but a moment ago, you asked me to wait. Oh, my darling, I... I can't hold you close enough. You know, I wish sometimes that you were in some great trouble so that I could do something really marvelous for you, risk my body and soul, everything. Please, you must read your letters, Torva. <laughs> what an insistent creature. Very well. Let me see. Hmm. This is strange. A letter from Krogstad. I wonder if he's going to ask... What's this? Nora, do you know what's in this letter? Yes. He says that, that you're a forger. That you forged your father's name. Is it true? I loved you, Tova. Answer me! Is it true? It was all because I loved you. Stop saying that! Yes, it's true. You fool! What have you done? Torval, you're not going to take this on yourself. You're not to try to save oh, me. Oh, don't be melodramatic. Do you understand what you've done? 
Yes? You've ruined my future. Do you know that? You've put me in the hands of a scoundrel. From now on, he can do whatever he likes with me. Demand what he chooses. Domineer over me as much as he likes, and I... I must submit to everything. When I'm out of the world, you'll be free. Out of the world? Oh, this is no time for fine phrases. What good would it do if you were out of the world? He blabbed the story just the same, and people might even suspect me of having been a part of it. Did you ever stop to think of that? They'd say that I was at the bottom of it, that I'd egged you on. And it's you I have to thank for all this. You, whom I've petted and spoiled all our married life. Now do you understand what you've done to me? Yes. I... I just can't believe it. I... I've got to keep him quiet somehow. That's it. People simply mustn't find out that there's anything at all out of the way. Well, we'll, uh, we'll make things look as though uh, nothing had happened between us and... Uh... Oh, what can that be at this hour? What is it? A letter for you, sir. Mr. Krogstad asked me to deliver it. Krogstad, give it here. Oh, what more can he do to me now? Torvald, Be I... quiet! Why? What? Look. It's a promissory note. It's your note. He's returned it. I, I don't understand. What does, he, what does he say? Returning your wife's note, I regret my actions in this matter. Mrs. Linden has convinced me that... Oh, Nora! Nora, thank God! I'm saved! I'm saved! And I? You too, yes, of course, darling. We're saved, Nora. It's all over. I'm... It's finished. I'm... I'll tear it up. I... I won't even look at it. The whole thing shall just disappear like a dream. Oh, Nora, Nora, these must have been terrible days for you. Yes, they have been. Yes, I see now. You did it because you loved me. It was just that you, well, you, you went about it in the wrong way, dear. You, you didn't have the experience to know how. But the next time you see, dearest, you, you must come to me. You do realize that, don't you? Nora, Nora, you're not going to remember the things I said, are you? Why, why the whole world seemed to be falling to pieces around me. It's all going to be forgotten. I forgive you. Thank you for your forgiveness, Torvald. Thank you. Is that all you have to say to me? Why, why do you look at me so strangely? Now, uh, dear, you'd, uh, you'd better go and get some sleep. I shall not sleep tonight. But it's late. It's not so late. Sit down, Torvald. Nora, what do you mean? Your face is so cold and set. Sit down, Torvald. Nora, you frighten me. I don't understand you. That's just it. You don't understand me. And I've never understood you until tonight. What do you mean? Doesn't one thing strike you as strange as we sit here? Nora, what are you talking about? We've been married eight years. Doesn't it occur to you that this is the first time we two have talked together seriously? Oh, my dear child. What have you to do with serious things? I've had a great injustice done me, Torvald. First by my father and then by you. By my, my, your father and me? Yes. When I was at home, father used to tell me all his opinions. And I always agreed with him. He used to call me his doll child and play with me, just the way I played with my dolls. And then I came to live in your house. Oh, what a way to talk about our well, marriage. Well, I mean, I changed hands from his to yours. And I heard your opinions and agreed with them, or pretended to. Nora. I've been living here like a beggar, by performing tricks for you. And that's the way you would have it. You and my father are responsible. It's your fault my life has come to nothing. Uh, Nora, haven't you been happy here? No. Only Mary. You've always been kind to me, but our house has been nothing but a nursery. I've been your doll wife, just as I used to be father's doll child. And in the same way, my children have been my dolls. That's what our marriage has been, Torvald. Well, well, perhaps there is some truth in what you say. But, Nora, from now on, it will be different. Yes, very different. I'm leaving you, Torval. What are you saying? I can't stay with you. You've lost your mind. I won't allow it. I'll spend the night with Christina, and tomorrow I'm going home. You mean that you propose to leave your home, your husband, and your children? And have you considered what people will say? I don't care what they say. From now on, I must think things out for myself. Oh, you talk like a child. Desert your home, you can't. These things are your duty, your sacred oh, duty. I have other duties equally sacred. Name them. My duty is toward myself. Before all else, I'm a human being, just as much as you are. And if I'm not, then I must try to become one. Nora, Nora, you're ill. I almost think that you're out of your senses. I've never felt so clear or so certain. Clear and certain enough to forsake your husband and children? Yes. Oh, then there's only one possible explanation. You don't love me anymore. Yes, that's just it. 
Nora. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. I don't love you anymore. You're clear and certain of that, too? Yes. And can you explain to me at what moment you, uh, you cease to love me? Yes, I can. It was this evening when the miracle that I expected to happen didn't happen. It was then I saw that you were not the man I'd imagined. I don't understand you. For eight years now, I've been waiting for a certain wonderful thing to happen. To happen between you and me. And I've been waiting patiently because I, I know that really wonderful things can't happen every day. And when I saw that this, this catastrophe was hanging over me, I said to myself, it's coming. The miracle is coming. When was this? Toval, when Crookstead's letter was lying in the box, it never occurred to me that you'd think for a minute of submitting to that man's conditions. I was certain that you'd say to him, all right, tell everybody, publish it to the whole world. And I was certain that after that... After that what? When I'd covered my wife's name with shame and disgrace? Oh, then I was sure you'd come forward and take the whole thing on yourself. You'd say, I'm the guilty one. I? But Nora... Oh, I'd never have accepted such a sacrifice. Of, of course not. But what would my word have been against yours? That was the miracle I hoped for and dreaded. And to prevent that, I, I wanted to die. Nora, I would gladly work day and night for you. I'd bear any sorrows and want. But no man sacrifices his honor even for the woman he loves. Millions of women have done it. Oh, you talk like a child. You think like a child. When you got over being frightened, not for me, but for yourself, and you knew there was nothing more to fear, then it was as if nothing had happened. I was your doll again, and you would take twice as much care of it in the future because I was so weak and fragile. Torvald, it burst on me in that moment that I'd been married for eight years to a man I hardly knew. But you're, you're still my wife now and always. Torvald... When a wife leaves her husband's house, as I'm doing, I've heard that in the eyes of the law, he's free from all duties to her. At all events, I release you from all duties to me. Here's your ring. Give me mine. Here are the keys. Tomorrow when I've left town, Christina will come and pack up the things I've brought from home. I'll have them sent after me. Is everything over? Nora... Will you never think of me again? Torvald, I shall often think of you and the children in this house. May I... May I write to you, Nora? No, never. You must But I must send you... No, I say... Can I never be anything more than a stranger to you? Perhaps. Someday. Oh, Torvald, for that, the miracle would have to happen. What's that? Both of us would have to change so that... Oh, but I no longer believe in miracles. Perhaps I do. Tell me, Nora. So changed that, that our marriage would be real, with a real love to hold us together. Goodbye. Nora, wait. Goodbye, Tom. Nora! A miracle. Perhaps someday. Yes, that miracle will happen. It's got to happen. So we take our leave of Ibsen's play. A little later, Melville Ruick brings you the important announcement mentioned earlier tonight. But now, we meet the two principal tenants of a doll's house, Joan Crawford and Basil Rathbun. Basil, <coughs> you're such a scoundrel in pictures, so persistently. How did it feel to take off the whiskers and play a less villainous role? Well, C.B., getting into a doll's house was like getting out of a dog's house. Um, I've played villains on the screen so long that every time the steam radiators hiss at my house, I take a bow. <laughs> but what's particularly interesting to me is that I've never been a villain on the air. I've often wondered, Basil, what type of letters the fans write to you men who put the menace in the movies. Oh, I get a lot of letters, Joan. <laughs> the only trouble is that they all seem to have the same idea. They just hope that someday I'll get the thrashing I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> but the more disliked you are by the audience, the better the producers like you. Well, that's comforting anyway. Um, I've been perforated by swords so many times, I now train on a bed of nails. Rather sad, don't you think? I never know just how to save my skin from lunging heroes. Did you ever try uh, Lux soap? Nine out of ten stars protect their skin with it. <laughs> yes, but, but Lux soap makes me look so completely lovely, Joan. I'd soon be out of work. 
Yes. I'd get to look like you, and that would... Oh, I mean... Oh, well... that's all right, Basil. I understand. And until I want to look like your partner in crime, I'm going to continue using Lux Soap, because I don't think there's anything nicer for a lovely complexion. And now, having disposed of Basil's problem, Mr. DeMille, my sincere thanks for bringing that doll's house to the air and allowing me to play Nora. And my appreciation, too, to Mr. Rathbone and to Mr. Jaffe, who made a special trip from New York to be here. And to Miss Netta Harrigan, Mr. Steele, and all the others in our cast. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Joan. Good night, C.B. Good night, Joan. Good night, Basil. There's another real treat in store for you next Monday night. In a moment, our producer, Mr. DeMille, will be back to tell you all about it. But while we are waiting, I want to tell you about our offer of a compact for the ladies. The response to this offer last week has been overwhelming, and it is repeated tonight so that no one need lose out. If you have not already sent for your genuine Van Style Double Compact, by all means do so tomorrow. Or if you have obtained one and want one or two more for a gift or for a bridge prize, you may have it now. It's difficult for a man to describe this compact and do it justice. All I can say is that it's swell. Perhaps I could help you describe it. Oh, would you please? Just tell the ladies in our audience how this compact appeals to you. Well, this is really the sort of compact every woman wants. Thin and lightweight, a delicate horseshoe shape of graceful design, curved in the front and square at the back. And, of course, there's no advertising on it. The top is finished as an in-gold effect and set in gleaming black enamel, the bottom richly tooled in a harmonizing pattern. It will remind you of a piece of fine old antique jewelry, and it's just as smart as it can be. The black and gold color combination makes it harmonize with any costume. It's a double compact with two compartments, one for loose powder and the other already filled with a cake of fine neutral shade rouge. And it's so easy to get rouge refills to match your own complexion. The clear, gleaming mirror is the full size of the cover. In many stores, this type of compact usually sells for a dollar. Well, thank you very much, but this compact does not cost our listeners a dollar. For the time being, our Lux Toilet Soap friends can get it for three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers and only 25 cents in coin. Send for yours at once. Now, let me repeat that. You need only three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers and 25 cents in coin. Hold the coin into the wrappers and enclose in an envelope with a slip of paper on which your name and address is printed clearly. Don't send stamps. Address Lux Toilet Soap. Box number one, New York City. Your compact will be mailed to you promptly. This offer is good only in the United States. So, buy three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Send three wrappers and only 25 cents in coin folded into them, together with a slip of paper with your name and address printed clearly, to Lux Toilet Soap, box number one, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Mr. DeMille. From the stern drama of a doll's house, we turn next Monday night to the gay romance of Columbia's highly successful comedy, Theodora Goes Wild. Starring in the title role will be the same delightful comedian whom you saw in the picture, Irene Dunn. And co-starred with Miss Dunn, the seasoned sensational comedy find, one of the most versatile stars in Hollywood, Cary Grant. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Cary Grant in Theodora Goes Wild. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our cast tonight included Celeste Rush as Ellen, John Russell as Ivar Helmer, Jackie Horner as Emmy Helmer, Frank Nelson as a messenger, and Eleanor Mitchell as Via. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for Josette. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>